Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech in Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media, and this is our Friday morning episode. Uh, today, we're going to be diving into X ray technology and how it's going to plan to be deployed in airport security in the US by an Australian company. We're going to be speaking to Micro X. Uh, they're opening up in the US on the uh, West Coast. Uh, and their X-ray technology is out to transform American airport security. We're going to be joined by the managing director here in Australia, Peter Rowland, and the chief uh, scientist and their CEO in the US, Brian Gonzalez, uh, and that's with Micro X. Uh, let's bring on the uh, the Australian boss first, Peter Rowland, the managing director, uh, and Brian Gonzalez, uh, who's in Atlanta but uh, based otherwise on the west coast. Uh, the CEO in the US, gents, thanks for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. Good, good. morning. Thank you. Um, Peter, uh, it's always good to hear um, uh, an Australian company moving into the US. Uh, it's always a bit of a shame too to see you, you're leaving, but you're kind of expanding really. That's the, the story here. Uh, maybe introduce us to MicroX. You're based in Adelaide and uh, the news that you uh, have expanded into SeaTech, uh, which is a, in Washington state. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're not we're not leaving, not not at oh, all. Thank you, but I know that was a mis, <laughs> mis word from me. Head I was like, head, whoops. <laughs> uh, head head office and, and and all our technology is still very much going to be based in uh, in Adelaide. So um, uh, look, uh, we've got a, a a brand new technology that a lot of people have been trying to trying to create around the world. We just managed to get there first in in nice. in creating an, an, an electronic. An, an electronic uh, controlled X-ray tube. Uh, it's it's the sort of difference from the old-fashioned uh, thermionic uh, hot filament tube, which is every other uh, traditional technology, to uh, to this solid state. It, it's like moving from an, an old-fashioned light bulb to a new LED. Uh, makes the tubes an awful lot smaller, uh, a lot lighter, a lot more energy efficient. Uh, but they're they're electronically controllable, which allows you to do some clever things with with using multiple tubes. Uh, do, does it make yeah. them safer as well in terms of things like radiation? And uh, Brian will have a presentation to walk us through the tech. But uh, obviously, with X-ray technology, there's always a control around the uh, radiation. Yes, in, look, in some aspects, it does. Uh, in in the end, the, the the amount of radiation you need is is really the function of the detector that you're using. We're using some de different detectors, which which will reduce the the dose, but but that's not the main focus of the technology. It's it's about yep. miniaturizing X ray, yeah, and, and making it mobile. Yeah, so our first our first product is is a is a bedside imager in the medical space, um, but but the the plan for Micro X is is to straddle both the medical and the uh, uh, security spaces. Um, we uh, we got involved in the in the in the security initially. Uh, through a contract from the Australian Defence Force to do uh, an X-ray camera. Uh, this is something basically which, um, you know, a self-contained box that can look at a package or a suspect device and, and, and give you an X-ray image of what's inside without the need to put a detector behind the, the object. Uh, and that led to a whole, whole new world, some contracts in the UK and then, the, uh, and then the, from the US. So and you're, you're ASX listed as well. How long has, have you been around? Uh, we listed on the ASX just before Christmas in 2015. Ah, okay. So we've been quite a, quite a while. Yeah. And uh, obviously this is part of that, that drive you listed to, you know, so obviously raise some funds and, and uh, exposure there for that US expansion. Yeah, well, look, the, the the strategy we're we're implementing here is we, you know, we're, we're, we're we are first in this exciting new technology. Uh, you know, how do we how do we make sure that we monetize that first mover advantage? Now, answer by getting a number of high value products into the market as quickly as we can. Yeah. So uh, hence the you know we've been raising raising capital on the on the ASX to uh, to fund a very very rapid expansion. Uh, so we've got we, there's four products that we're looking at: two in the medical space, two in the security space, and we're driving those to market as hard and as fast as we can. Nice. On the basis that if somebody tries to catch up with us, they'll they'll be five or six years behind, and we'll be so far ahead we won't care. That's well, the plan. interesting. You know, just off uh, pre-interview, while uh, Brian and I were talking a long time ago, I looked at a ballistics project and trying to miniaturize 
uh, a piece of technology and it's you know uh, it's quite a, an amazing achievement even to get as far as you have you know it's a real challenge uh, and you've got to have a lot of drive and, and trust in in your own instincts and what you're doing Brian uh, there you're on on the road at the moment you're in Atlanta but uh, you've been with the company a few years uh, and you're the chief scientist um, maybe if you could maybe just talk us around how that US uh, how you potentially see the US market uh, for this and how well they'll receive it. Uh, and then also you've got a, some slides to share in terms of talking us through the tech. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I think um, I think that the, the US market, it, it's, it's quite an interesting market because um, contrary to every other airport market, you know, airports throughout the world are generally regulated by governing bodies. Every, every, comp every government has its own entity and agency that sets standards, but it's up to airports to deploy and maintain that security according to the standard. The US is different. In the US, there, the regulator is also the customer. That customer, TSA, maintains 440 different airports throughout the United States. And they have a interest in uniformity across those airports. So whether you are entering uh, at Cheyenne, Wyoming, or you're coming in through LAX, you're going through the same security. And they really yep. want to keep it that way so that you can transition from terminals. So to get a customer excited about what you're doing gives you a tremendous advantage and tremendous opportunity to shift the entire market in the US and potentially globally because they're such a driver of how that goes. And that's really long-term wh where our mind is at with this yep. market and this opportunity. And it really is that huge opportunity of the U.S. airport market. You know, if you try to even try it here, uh, Peter, you've got, I don't know, half a dozen airports really compared to hundreds in the U.S., uh, just no comparison. So you're in the right right part of the world. Um, Brian, maybe just talk us through the tech uh, and then the actual, uh, you've got the Rover system, but uh, I haven't seen your slide. So maybe just introduce, yeah. Yeah, I can bring your screen up. Sure. Um, I'm happy you to lose. talk. There you go. Great work. Uh, let me just get rid of that caption for you. And uh, yeah, go go for it. What have you got? Sure. So quickly to set the stage, um, our core technology allows us to reduce the x-ray. So what you see at the top here, this is a conventional x-ray medical tube. Now, in x-rays, you can make small tubes, but the output, the performance of the x-ray depends on the size. So if you need high quality images, you need to scan something more challenging like a bag, you need a very big x-ray. And we're able to deliver the same performance with something that is a, about a, a tenth the size and a twentieth the weight. So oh, a yeah. significant change in size and it's also significantly more efficient and significantly more precisely controlled. And so in the first instance, um, we've applied that in the medical space. And here you can see our two medical products. On one side, you see the CareStream DRX Revolution Nano, which was our first product that is uh, on sale through our uh, commercial distributor into hospitals worldwide. And on the other side, you can see the MicroX Rover. And both of these show units that have been lined up that we sold quite a few units as we were selling in response to COVID. Um, the unit has been a key impact globally in fighting COVID. And we even sold a bunch to the WHO for deployment into uh, remote regions in the Pacific Islands. So quite excited about the medical applications, but to jump right into the, the security, um, to set the ground, we, co we conceived a miniaturized baggage scanner and to use an array of our small X-ray tubes to take CT in a much, much, much smaller package. And you can see some of the early imaging studies we did. We can create three-dimensional renderings of bags. We're looking at the, the actual, we, with our backscatter technology, which is looking at the x-rays going forward and the x-rays coming back. We can look at the plastics. We can look at if something's hidden inside of something. And this work was all funded by the UK Department of Transport because the UK was also very interested. But as we were moving forward, we were kind of looking at what the checkpoint looks like. And the checkpoint is really, uh, I like to describe it as a one lane highway or a one lane road. And um, in that one lane road, as you sequentially walk through the checkpoint, 
there's all of these different um, key decision points or bottlenecks that exist and key different separated sensors. And we kind of looked at it at that and we said, even if we had a very small, very fast sensor as number five in this image, you still have all those other bottlenecks. You still have all those other decision-making points. So even if we could bring a very small X-ray unit to the market, how would that really drive a change? Because this is, this is a, a, a industry and a situation that's really hungry for a change. And so what we ended up conceiving, and, and it, was to, it was part of the UK project, and we were at a UK Department of Transport event, and uh, we were talking with different stakeholders in the industry, particularly Heathrow Airport, um, but also representatives from TSA who were visiting. Um, an idea was born of what if you could consolidate all of those different points into one localized region and turn a one lane road into a multi-lane highway? What if you could create a situation where instead of one long sequential screening, you had consolidated portals? And we uh, conceived this based around our miniaturized baggage screener using our, our X-ray technology. And you can see on the side here, uh, an image of what our initial concept looked like, where we had a, a personal screener and the baggage screener. And in this first concept, we were kind of thinking about the automated passport control gates that you would go through coming into Australia when people could travel into Australia. And um, that's, that's what we were thinking. And we presented these ideas to the TSA and to DHS in, in the US, and they liked them a lot. And so, but, but they were concerned about the on-person screening. This is more like a metal detector. And so what, what we ended up working out with them and, and where we're moving forward is kind of, is a portal. And MicroX was selected to be a, the, the prime on putting together what this entire portal will look like. And this, this is a modular portal. It brings together the on-person or, or what the, the US government is calling property scanner. Uh, we would call a baggage scanner. It's basically all of your property that you're carrying through, your backpack, your roller bag. Um, so that's a miniaturized X-ray scanner that we, can, that we are also building as part of this work. And the, the, the hardware, all of, all of the innovative technology for that miniaturized scanner is going to be coming out of Adelaide. It's going to be building on the work that we've done in Adelaide and it will be manufactured in Adelaide. And then together, we will, we're partnering with uh, uh, other partners, other high technology companies, such as Alenium Automation, a Melbourne company, um, to do different components of this, to bring them all together. So we have the, the baggage screener, we have the passenger identification and verification process. We have the on-person screening, um, the millimeter wave, uh, the thing that looks, oh, are you hiding something underneath your clothing? Um, and then all of those different components are integrated together to make a single more intelligent decision about the passenger. You know, is there something in your pocket? Did it end up in the bag? Did you put it there? Um, do the different bags or items you have together, do you have something that in the single bag isn't a threat, but when you put it together is a threat? These sorts of integrated decisions are now possible with this approach. And in addition to that, um, we can bring a level of automation that you can't bring to the conventional approach. In the conventional approach, when it's this sequential approach, if there's automation in the baggage screener, if there's automation on the on-person screener, if there's any false alarm, if there's anything that needs more time to resolve, there's something yeah. that comes up that says, hey, that's suspicious, the whole thing bogs down. Whereas when you've paralyzed it, if you need to spend a little bit more time saying, hey, the algorithm has said there's something, you should look at it, even if it turns out to be nothing. Now, because it's paralyzed, you have the time to make that decision. And so this approach allows us to bring a true level of automation. And you know, as everyone in the automation world, as we're learning, 
there's, there's no such thing as true, complete automation. Automation only works when a human being works with it. And so rather than saying the human being working with the automation is an officer, we're saying that the human being working with the automation is actually the passenger. The passenger is partnering with the automation to screen their own stuff. And that's why we call it passenger self-screening in the same way that a, a customer at a a uh, grocery store works with the automation in a self checkout kiosk to to go through that. It's the same concept where they're being prompted, they're they're being guided through the process so that the automation can be safely leveraged to do what automation does well. Look for patterns, look for the needle in the haystack, and then draw that to the attention of a highly trained agent who can say, yes, that's an issue or no, it's not. And most of the items will simply say there was nothing here to be concerned. So this modular approach allows us to do that in a way that we can't with conventional technology. Yeah, look, I've yes. not seen anything like it. It's uh, There's a lot of opportunity here. I've got 100 questions. Let me just go back to the previous slide on the layout, this one here. Um, and Peter, in your discussions with, say, airport security, it's one of the biggest issues with the layout, the current layout of screening uh, sort of bays is the space that they take up. Uh, and as uh, Brian sort of mentioned, the queues that they create and, and the like, uh, this is almost a, aligned with how the portals for uh, the passport screening process is going through, where it's all singular uh, and then multiple portals. Where, where's the real sort of the business case here for you? Um, or there are multiple business cases here? Because this one is definitely a business case in terms of the speed that you can get people through. And as Brian points out, you don't get the bottleneck anymore uh, where you can sort of move that aside. Um, or is it also, I imagine you're using advanced manufacturing in this as well. So because it's smaller, micro, you, you know, might be cheaper, easier to transport and then deploy, you know, you're saving costs there. Where, where are the, where's the real business case or the multiple business cases for you? Uh, the, the, for us, the, the business case is in, in, in making the, the scanners and, and, uh, and, and, and supplying the integrated portals to airports. Uh, the airports themselves uh, are excited because, uh, you know, they, from the airport's business point of view, uh, someone in a queue for security isn't spending any money. Um, so they're, you know, they're occupying a lot of real estate that, that mm. actually could be another, could be another shop. Um, and, you know, airports in, in, in Europe particularly compete on passenger experience and, and passengers get very stressed with the, the conveyor belt security concept because they get parted from everything that's important, you know, your yep. watch and your wallet is, is sat out there while you're getting frisked down and anyone can pick it off. So the, the passenger experience, the financial, you know, uh, they want to get you through security and spending more money, um, all, all point to this. And, and of course, the with, with automated threat detection, which is the, the core of what Brian's talking about here, the um, it, the reduction in, in manpower is, is, is what funds it all because yep. uh, the, the current systems are not only require a human to make the primary assessment of threat or no threat, um, <clears throat> but just helping passengers through and, and uh, uh, as well as resolving false alarms is, is uh, a big part of it. So you don't have to make a big dent in the, in the, in the, in the staffing before you've paid for these very, very quickly. I suppose it's also the business case of when you've got so many portals that creates uh, more units in the field for you, um, which is also a good thing. What type of advanced manufacturing are you doing? Are you getting assistance uh, here in Australia with that as well? Because obviously the scale, you know, you've got 400 odd airports, there's thousands of airports around the world. How are you able to scale this? You've also yeah. got the medical field as well, right? So you've got a we big have. market. We're planning. Uh, we're planning a fairly big business in X-ray tube production, uh, yeah. and the, the scaling that is is is, uh, is is one of our big projects in the next couple of years. There's no question. Um, and uh, but uh, you know, long long term, uh, you know, whatever the USA uh, implements, you know, very quickly becomes the the, the global standard. Yep. And that's why this this work with the DHS is so important. And I think the um, the other thing is that you know with automated threat detection as 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 terrorist threats evolve so does the uh you know so will our algorithms to to detect new threats and evolving threats 
and and you know our our new our new uh, setup in in uh, that Brian's running in in Seattle is very much focused on that the software of image reconstruction and threat detection and and that's that's not a one shot that's going to continue to evolve uh, with our our key government customers as as their intelligence uh, uh, shows how the the terrorist threat evolves. And you mentioned before you were previously working with Defence on a mobile X-ray machine. Are, are you have you looked at the robotic side where you can sort of have this moving around potentially at looking at potentially disruptive or uh, suspicious packages? Yeah, they, they well suspicious package is a, a different device. They but the the thing we've uh, uh, we're uh, we're in the final stages of developing right now. Uh, we demonstrated the technology to the Australian Department of Defence some years ago. Uh, is a, a backscatter imager. This uh, the idea is it's just a self-contained box like a camera, and uh, it's a box so that a robot can pick it up and go down, go uh, go down over the target and get a, a high-resolution X-ray image, well, or a very quick bomb no bomb assessment, uh, which is yeah. very important because in in uh, the, the, they, they talk us through the scenarios of the Boston bombing, for instance, when after the first bomb went off and, and the crowd panics and flees, the 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 area was was littered with, uh, you know, handbags Bags. and backpacks and you know all kinds of things. And it's a it's a typical terrorist um, uh, operational uh, plan to have three or four more bombs hidden in that because now they're they're trying to encourage the security forces to come in. Uh, as they're the primary target to uh, to a number of booby trap devices, so it took them with conventional technology many days before they could clear every single discarded item in that in that area. Uh, and on our, our our device will be able to do that very very quickly. And obviously, that's picking up the X-ray and then remotely. Uh, is yep. that just a yep. you have to be within a, a line of sight or is a, a sort of a cloud platform same, as well potentially? Same as uh, not not to the cloud, no, because uh, there's obviously security issues there. But uh, yeah. uh, generally, these things, like the robot themselves, work. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be line of sight; it's radio controlled, and the image will come back to an operator via radio. Um, but generally, they're looking at 500 meters as a safe radius, something like that. Yeah, Brian, maybe back to you and a, a sort of a closing question of. Um, the, the, that scale, and you talked about, you know, the analytics there and the video analytics and, and the like. How do you? I don't know if that's your field. You probably might be more on the X-ray side, but how do you see that scaling as well? Is this going to be proprietary software, or do you find that you are going to be in a sort of a, a cloud platform that, because all of that, there's going to be a lot of learning, machine learning there, if you're scanning images uh, on a bigger scale than what the currently is, because the portal approach. You know, you're you're really creating a lot more images uh, at at a at a more speedy time, I suppose, or a more uh, timely uh, approach. Yeah, look, the the uh, the first most important thing to consider with that is is passenger privacy when it comes to images, and and that's something that um, that we care a lot about because we believe that this concept only works when passengers feel comfortable and use the system well. And if there's anything in this process that prevents a passenger from feeling comfortable, it's not going to work. So security is important, but so are passengers and balancing those. But subject to passenger privacy concerns and, and working through that, yes, um, there will be a tremendous amount of data generated. And it is our hope that we can continue to, we already are, and we can continue to engage with world leading partners in drawing the best from that those images. We're already partnered with several other companies to do that um, globally, and and it's our hope that we can continue to host and lead um, uh, and uh, create a community of people around this who will take this data and do very clever things with yeah. it that will benefit everybody. So yeah, I think we, uh, the way the way it would work, the way I'm picturing that, and and sort of thinking how that would work, even at just that airport level, because you're doing so many more. Uh, you still do the same amount, but still it's not like the passengers uh, are less, but you're doing more at the same time. And so therefore there's some other potential applications out of that. Um, and finally, final question, and we'll bring on uh, Xtech. I don't know if you've met Xtech, but uh, I don't know if, they've, if you two have met, but you both got X in the name, so it might be worth you uh, having a chat offline afterwards. But um, the airport sector, do you think COVID 
is potentially an opportunity for you. The, the airport sector will want to sort of reinvent invent itself. The airlines want to reinvent itself after this and get people back flying and comfortable again. Brian mentions the, the user experience. Is this a potential opportunity rather than a, you know, uh, sucked a lot of money out of the industry uh, potentially from losses? But yeah, do you, do you get a sense that they're keen to come back with some new ideas? Very, very much so, and I and I think we're already seeing the the acceleration of of this uh, with the TSA in in, in uh, Washington D.C. We're already seeing that acceleration driven by by the desire to to go self service. Yeah. I and mean, if you think that self service is is attacking every other part of the airport, but but not yet security, but just minimizing that personal contact in a in in a in a pandemic is uh, obviously a huge huge benefit to passengers and and the staff yeah like. well there's a lot of uh, a lot of innovation in that field even just with the facial recognition systems coming in the uh, uh, the terms not coming to me we've covered it before in terms of that uh, the risk assessment on a, at a passenger level uh, from uh, from the car from the time they get out of the car uh, in the airport field in the lounge all the way through uh, they're being uh, assessed so this is just another one I love that portal idea uh, and with a sort of a reduced size mobile uh, device and an X-ray technology, definitely big opportunities. So it's an ASX listed company. Are you only on ASX? You're not listed anywhere else as well? No, just ASX. All right. Um, okay. Well, one to watch out for and uh, we'll definitely keep an eye uh, on MicroX. Uh, we've been joined by Peter Rowland, Managing Director here in Australia, and Brian Gonzalez, the Chief Scientist and CEO in the US. Uh, on the road and uh, their x-ray technology is set to transform American airport security. Thank you very much, gents. Uh, I'll put you backstage uh, and like I said, we'll uh, we'll keep in touch over the longer term. It's a good story to follow. Best of luck. Excellent. Been great chatting. Thank you. Thank you. All the best.